Another harrowing tale of utter brutality, this story plumbs the depths of darkness contained in the human psyche. We open on a sweeping pan of turbulent waters, a possible foreshadowing of events to come. Then we meet Rob and Pia, a loving couple enjoying a scenic ride along an isolated island road to nowhere. The sophisticated Ozzy and his artistic French lover eventually arrive at their destination, a little harbor where Pia employs an ultra-deep V to let them things breathe in the salty ocean air. At the same time, Rob procures their rods and a little puddle jumper. Very soon they're off, motoring out of the harbor to enjoy an intimate afternoon of fishing on their little craftsman special. Out at sea, the waters prove to be a little bit too calm, prompting them to begin discussing the banalities of daily life. This is a touchy subject as Rob works as a barrister and the inequities of the legal system disgust her French sensibilities. But they're interrupted when Pia snags a biggin, an absolutely beautiful flathead. That's Disgusting! Well, that's fishing, baby. Time spent pursuing what you don't want, an apt metaphor for life. Eventually, the weather begins to shift and the threatening clouds convince them to pack it in for the day. However, Rob doesn't put out rental money idly, and he suggests they return via an exploration of the nearby mangroves. So, he gets the old Honda 4-cycle humming and they casually tool along, while back at the harbor we see that all the experienced seamen have already tied in for the day. But the mangroves, they're so bushy and swampy, truly a sight to behold. It's like trees in the water, and when do you get to see that? They glide smoothly and deeply into the bushy inlet, and as the horizon falls below the tree line, it gives the impression of sinking. To that end, they do eventually run aground, turning their relaxing jaunt into a grueling workout. They eventually find themselves in an agricultural drain, which is good because it leads Rob to believe they may be en route to finding a functional farm somewhere ahead. Pia curses this inefficient pathway back towards civilization, and as they wander the landscape, they do eventually come upon other people, but quickly discern that they are witnessing a scene of rural violence. Desiring to avoid interfering with local customs, they are driven further inland in their retreat. When all seems hopeless, they become a wash in relief when the light of a nearby farmhouse acts as a summoning beacon, guiding them through the pouring rain. Upon closer inspection, the farmhouse is not particularly inviting, but when faced with the risk of soaking their wetsuits, they decide to take their chances with the residents therein. But no one answers, so Rob decides to search around back and eventually emerges from the other side of the front door. Pia is not comfortable with this plan, but he assures her that it's not breaking in if no one's home, and he is a barrister, so… Once inside, it becomes abundantly obvious that this is not a location where one should linger, so they focus their efforts on finding a phone. Rob goes to check for an outside phone, and when he opens the barn, discovers ample evidence that what they interpreted as abandonment just happens to be how these boys live. Then the fellers roll up and spot Pia peeking out the window. The two pair up and consider fleeing the premise, but the homeowner insists they reveal themselves in a very authoritative manner. Compelled to comply, Rob puts on his attorney hat and tries to talk his way out of this mess. I mean, we're all mates here, right? I'm not your mate, Robert! Well, I find that to be close-minded. Rob attempts to brainstorm as many ideas as he can think of, which they just repeat back to him condescendingly, which is so frustrating. They don't have anything to offer the men who already have everything. Then Jimmy suggests that if Poppy saw intruders in the homestead, he would freak. So while Brett goes to escort their father, Jimmy's demeanor immediately softens as he invites them inside. And then when Pia starts speaking with a French accent, he really starts treating her nice. For instance, he offers to let her pet his hairless baby wallaby, which is not a euphemism. Unfortunately, this is what their evening looks like because the switchboard closes at 7.30. Pia asks if he can escort them to the local hotel, confirming for sure that she is just not getting it. The best he can do with the rains coming in is an offer to drive them into town the next day. In the meantime, he'd like to recommend a hot shower and some dry clothes. They accept this, but mostly because their time in the shower stall gives them a chance to scheme up how they want to try to get out of this situation. But it also causes them to fall for the oldest trick in the book is Jimmy absconds with their clothes. Rob decides that it's time to step up, so he marches right in there wearing nothing but a stylish Henley and a towel. It's hard to be forceful with your balls hanging out, so his general plea is that the fellas give him a break. But Jimmy seems to be tied up and letting out some sort of classist aggression, and reasons 
reasons his way into considering his behavior appropriate due to the differential living circumstances between them. Rob instead asks to speak with the big man upstairs who they are both deathly afraid of. This causes Jimmy to relent somewhat and offer to have them work off their hospitality debt by having Pia cook for them. But what the boys are hungry for is some French talking, which she uses to communicate a potential plan to Rob. So, Rob serves them obediently and puts up with their degradations for the sake of securing their escape. Even when they ask to see Pia's butt like a couple of horny 14-year-olds, Brett sure does think that looks better than what he's used to getting in the barn. But with all this distraction, she ends up burning the last of the eggs. Once Jimmy deems them not bussin', he insists she butchers the wallaby as a main course. Rob tries to step in on behalf of his lady, but they get all up in his face. With uncertainty about what they're capable of, she builds up the courage to do what must be done. After a fine meal, they seem to be calmed somewhat and try to get to know their guests a bit more. But when they find out these salt-of-the-earthers are actually an artist and barrister, it works them back into a manic state. But all their jackknobbing nearly wakes Poppy, wanting to keep the fun times rolling, Jimmy gets his greasy ass all up in their faces before showing them to the barn. Once alone, they immediately find some stray trousers, giving them a chance to cover up and take to the wilderness. But in following the road, they inevitably come across the evening's prior victim, who they discover to have been murdered. In their despair, they fail to avoid getting flanked by Brett and the dog on one side, and Jimmy in the truck on the other. Back in the barn again, Rob decides it's time to barter, but they have no need for quid. Their needs run deeper than all that. Getting the gist of where this is going, Rob gets brave, but a little warning shot settles that urge temporarily. Bia then reveals that she's preggers, which does not deter the boys at all, causing tempers to flare back up again. This time, Rob gets busted up to a more significant degree. The prior warning shot woke Poppy, who is much lither than he appears. He assesses the quality of their goonery and finds himself displeased. As a result, he takes to meeting out punishment and suggests they'll have time to work out what comes next after a good sleep. Warning their captives that the dog likes to patrol the barn, and if you're menstruating, you're better to steer clear of him. When the trio gets back inside, we learn that Poppy likes to be measured in his approach because he's afraid of catching a case due to prior convictions. This is a very reasonable concern that Brett and Jimmy should have considered. Brett tries to make himself useful by going to search for the dog, while nearby in the barn, Pia works to splint up her boy. When the boy eventually wakes up, he sees his lady in a most peculiar fashion, diligently fabricating a sort of chastity token. Seeing the writing on the wall, she is now motivated to take extreme measures to ensure their safety. She surveys the area and pushes her artistic mind to enter a state of flow. And since her medium of choice happens to be fishing gear, the circumstances couldn't be more advantageous. As a result, she allows her muse to get down with the sickness. Inside, the boys passed out while communally touching themselves. Brett is startled awake by the dog and sent out to check on things. When he gets to the barn, he saunters in like Billy Badass. But Pia pops up real quick and leverages her feminine wiles to turn him against his family. When I look deep in your eyes, I can see that you follow your brother, but you're not like him. You're different than him. It's powerful stuff. The pressure reaches a crescendo that ends with Rob springing the trap, and by God, Brett ends up hanging by his tender face meat. When the shotgun misfires and his flesh begins to give way, Bia is forced to slaughter his little ass like a baby wallaby, an act that she now finds unnervingly cathartic. The dog comes strolling up to the barn like a land shark, thirsty for blood, while inside, Poppy decides that he's ready for lady time. Jimmy goes to fetch her and also wonders about Brett's fate. They claim to have not seen him, and that the body-shaped tarp nearby is best left alone. Pia pretending to escape distracts him from this, and so he brings her along, sniffing her the whole way. Once inside, he dolls her up the way Poppy likes. Poppy also has a thing for being found, so she is sent up on her own. Pia loses the coin toss on whether or not he would have bothered bathing himself, and he talks about all of his prior wives as he hoists his moist, heaving mass atop her. He likes to take an impressive first thrust, which, in this case, results in him finding himself stuck in a raccoon trap of sorts. Given the contraption, I imagine his penis is blooming, if you can picture that. Jimmy moves quick when his daddy's gens are on the line, and he ends up chasing Pia down and out the front door. When he arrives at the barn, things are eerily quiet. Thinking he has them cornered, he takes a couple of pot shots at a cabinet, from which his brother's dripping corpse hops out to deliver a big, wet, sloppy kiss. 
The two victims escape and lock him in the barn before making for the truck. Unfortunately, it does not contain any keys. Peter rushes inside to check all the standard spots, while Poppy continues his attempts to extricate his wiener from her honey trap. She eventually finds them and manages to glass Pops before running back out. But there are so many keys! Luckily, the dog shows back up, and Poppy is on his menzies now, which is like catnip for dogs. Jimmy then finally breaks out but turns the corner and is taken aback to find his father getting eaten out by the family dog. Through all of this, Pia finally arrives at the correct key and fires up the truck. Not one to let things go, Jimmy proceeds to air up the hovercraft, but on his way out he gets anchored by his brother's corpse. While momentarily caught up, Pia decides to run him down, which ends with him on the hood. But while he's dicking around up there, making sure they understand what he intends to do to them, the hovercraft slowly comes about. So when another impact pushes him back, he is reduced to a hearty stew. And then some of them lived happily ever after, we presume. Well, that was brutal, but if you're looking to go deeper than that, be sure to check out this video next. And now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.